Dear congregation, last week, as you recall, we commenced the study of the New Testament epistle of 1 John. And I promised you at that time that we would be alternating messages from week to week as we undertake a study at the same time of the book of Genesis. And this morning, we want to commence with chapter 1. Our text this morning is simply the first four words, in the beginning, God. And my goal this morning is simply, with God's help, to provide you with an introduction to the book of Genesis in general and its first chapter in particular. And next time, God willing, two weeks from now, we'll look more closely at the actual text of Genesis 1. We have four thoughts this morning. First, we want to look at the structure and purpose of Genesis. Second, the subject and object of Genesis 1. Third, the major truths about God in Genesis 1. And fourth, we'll see those major truths applied to us. So our theme, the introduction to the book of Genesis and its first chapter, the structure and purpose of Genesis, subject and object of Genesis 1, major truths about God in Genesis 1, and those major truths applied. The word Genesis is the Greek title for the first book of the Bible, boys and girls, and it means beginning or origin, a very obviously suitable name for this book, because here is the origin of mankind and the beginnings of all kinds of doctrines and truths. The truth about God, the truth about the world, the truth about man, man created in God's image. The truth about Sabbath and marriage and the devices of Satan, about man's fall and sin and judgment, all begin in this book of Genesis. As do the truths about God's sovereign election, salvation, justification by faith. Think of Genesis 15. The truths about Christ and his priesthood, about the church, about prayer, about the establishment and destiny of God's covenant people. Truths about family and culture and language and government. Truths about blessing and cursing of the Most High God. All these subjects and many more have their origin in this amazing and wonderful book. A book that covers more history than all, in terms of dates, than all the other Bible books combined. Throughout Genesis, we get vivid views of man's complete ruin and sin, our tragic fall. And we get strong proclamations of God's perfect remedy in Christ. This is a wonderful book, a staple book. A foundational book. The Bible without Genesis would not be the book it is. This is a book of great explanation of origins. Well, this book, perhaps unknown to you, has a very clear structure. And I want to take just two or three minutes to, to show that to you briefly. Genesis is actually built around ten major sections or you could say 11 if you include the introduction. And every one of these sections begins with the words beginning, or these are the generations, or these are the books of the generations. If you have your Bible open, I'll walk you through these just a quick moment so you get a good feel of this. Genesis 1 verse 1 through 2 3, which we read this morning, is the history of creation. Then you look at the second section, Genesis 2, verse 4, 
Notice how it begins. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. So two through four, or two four rather, through four twenty six is the history of the heavens and the earth. Then look at Genesis five verse one, the third section. This is the book of the generations of Adam. So the history of Adam. That carries on through 6 verse 8. Then chapter 6 verse 9 through 9 verse 29 is the history of Noah. Chapter 10 verse 1 through 11 verse 9, the history of the sons of Noah. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Chapter 11 verses 10 through 26, the history of Shem in particular. God is narrowing down, you see, that his his. His line, the godly line in the generations. Then in chapter 11, verse 27, we read of the history of Terah. And that includes the history of Abraham, his son. And that carries us all the way through to chapter 25. Then you notice in chapter 25, verse 12 through 18, we have the history of Ishmael, Abraham's son by Hagar. 25, verse 19 through 35, verse 29, the history of Isaac, including his sons. Chapter 36, the history of Esau. Chapter 37, beginning at verse 2, to the end of the book, the history of Jacob, and especially focusing on his son, Joseph. So these are the 11 sections, all introduced with the same phraseology. The clear, structural division in this book. So we could describe Genesis as a book with an, with an introduction about creation followed by ten books representing ten stages of history in which God's settled purpose of redemption through the chosen line of His people is being traced from generation to generation. Now a simpler division, of course, is to simply say Chapters 1 through 11 deal with the general history of mankind. And chapters 12 through 50 deal with the special history of God's people. Actually, Abraham is the pivotal figure, isn't he, in this book of Genesis. The first 11 chapters are very broad and they narrow into a funnel to reach Abraham, the father of all the faithful. And then the rest of the book broadens out the historical description of how God's promise is carried on through Abraham's generations so that a great nation descended from him, out of which ultimately Jesus Christ would be born. And that really is the best way to look at Genesis, because Genesis, more than anything else, is a book of divine revelation. God revealing himself to his chosen people, revealing his person and nature as far as we are able to know Him, and revealing His works and purposes and plans, as far as we are able to understand them. And that is indicated already in the the opening words of the book, In the Beginning, God. You see, the book sets us immediately into the very presence of the living God, in whom we live and move and have our being, physically and spiritually. So there is this Wonderful, simple, profound beginning. In the beginning, God. No argument is used to prove God's existence. It's presupposed as a fact to be believed. But in these opening four words, with a few strokes of his pen, Moses, the author of Genesis, repudiates atheism, for he declares the existence of God. He repudiates materialism, for he distinguishes between God and his material creation. He repudiates pantheism, for he asserts immediately the personalness of God as a personal creator. And he refutes polytheism, many gods, for he sets forth God as the only God. So this is the great purpose of Genesis, to reveal God. To show who God is. To put God on the foreground. To show Him as creator and sustainer and provider. And as redeemer and Lord of history. As the God who works through all history. 
to fulfill His purposes to His own glory and to the salvation of His people. And so Genesis is not so much a history of man as it is a history of God's sovereign, gracious beginnings in the redemption of fallen sinners. Now you might say, of course, that isn't that the purpose of the whole Bible from Genesis 1 through Revelation to reveal this awesome triune God? And of course it is. And our greatest need is always to come to know this God. We need that as unbelievers to be saved, and we need it as believers to grow in the knowledge and the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is life eternal, that we might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, says John. And so really, not only Genesis, but the whole Bible, the Old and New Testaments are all about divine revelation. In fact, The whole Old Testament with which Genesis begins is is really a testament that declares God. In my study, of course, there are many different books on the Old Testament written by Old Testament scholars. And I, I looked at those who tried to bring all the Old Testament themes under one subject to say what the Old Testament was all about. I found one scholar who said, The central theme of the Old Testament is the covenant of God. Another one said the holiness of God. Another one said Israel's election is the people of God. Another one said the rulership of God. Then the kingdom of God. Communion with God. The promises of God. And one even said the experience of God. When I got all done, I thought to myself, what do all these have in common? God. God is the grand and the glorious theme. Of the entire Old Testament. And the, and the book of Genesis paves the way for that. It begins that way. In the beginning, God. You see, that's the foundational truth of all reality. Of all theology. That's the foundation of the truth of your life, my friend. You are here because in the beginning, God. This is where evangelism must begin. Arminianism begins evangelism with John 3.16. Reformed people begin evangelism with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. You are, I am, a creature of the great Creator. And immediately, we are placed before this personal Creator, before whom we are responsible. So the whole Bible is a theocentric book. A God-centered book. And we find that in the very opening words of the Bible. And all the truths that Genesis will bring to us are like so many colors coming out of a prism. But they all come from the one great shaft of light. The God who is light. Who shines into the prism of our earthly existence. And casts as a beautiful rainbow all His truths at our feet throughout Scripture. But in the very beginning of Scripture, He gives us this bright shaft of light, as it were. He says, in the beginning, God. So true religion, true theology, begins with God. And it works its way down to us. That's the Reformed faith. Arminianism begins with man and works its way back up to God. That is foreign to the Scriptures. You see, many people misunderstand Genesis. They look at it as a man-centered book, as an explanation of man. Or they try to turn Genesis into a book of biology or geology. But Genesis is not that. Not that primarily. It's not scientifically inaccurate. But Genesis is not about biology or geology so much as it is about theology. It's a book about God. It introduces us, may I say it with reverence, to the living triune God of heaven and earth. And it tells us how poor, needy sinners, such as you and me, are to come to this God and worship this God and find salvation in this God and love this God and serve and fear this God. 
Now, when we turn to the subject and object of Genesis 1, our second thought this morning, and we look at this chapter in particular, we must say that both its subject and its object is God. Let me explain. Look at Genesis 1 a moment. Just visually look at it. Look at the beginning of each, each verse. Just cast your eyes down the beginning of each verse, the first two or three words of each verse. And what do you see? Would you like to deepen your understanding of Reformed theology? Check out Reform Systematic Theology, Volume 4, Church and Last Things by Dr. Joel Beakey and Paul Smalley. This book will lead you to explore key scripture topics from biblical, doctrinal, experiential, and practical perspectives. Order the culmination of Dr. Beakey's life's work at heritagebooks.org slash rst4. And God said, and God saw, and God called, and God made. You see, the subject of this chapter is God. And that is true of the whole work of creation. And that's how we need to approach this chapter and this book. We need, in the midst of all the debates about creation and and various methods of how you interpret Genesis 1-1 in relation to Genesis 1-2, and the whole debate with evolution and all the various issues involved, we need to remember, first of all, that Genesis 1 is written in a God-centered, worshipful frame. We approach Genesis 1 remembering who God is. And what he is like and how he acts and what is important to him. That's what we find here. God is the great subject of all creation. Now the Bible confirms that in other places as well, doesn't it? Psalm 19 verse 2 is very well known. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth Knowledge, knowledge of God. Now, that is true also of our spiritual lives, isn't it? There are many parallels, by the way, between God's natural creation and our spiritual recreation as believers. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, For God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So as God begins earthly creation, saying, let there be light, and he shines with light into the dark chaos of this world, so God begins spiritual recreation with the light of God in Jesus Christ and shines into the chaos of our wicked and corrupt and fallen hearts. So, God is the great subject of this book of Genesis and of chapter 1 in particular. But God is also the object. And what do I mean by that? Well, why does God do what he does? Both here in Genesis 1 and throughout all of Scripture, God says that he has himself and his glory as its ultimate goal. And that is true from eternity past all the way through time to eternity future. Scripture says that God determined to create all things for His own glory. So God is not only the subject, God is also the object of creation. In the book of Revelation, the elders in heaven bear witness to that so beautifully when they fall before him and they say in Revelation 4 verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, subject, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created, object. So everything revolves around God. 
The purpose of creation is not to make you feel good or to keep you healthy or to let you get what you want. The purpose of creation and the purpose that you are sent into this world, the whole goal and object of everything about your existence is the honor and the glory of the Creator. God gives you life and calls you to glorify Him. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end of Scripture, of your life, of spiritual life, of everything. May I ask you, friend, this morning, is God the subject, the supreme subject, the supreme object of your life? Do you meditate on Him? Are you focused on Him? But also, is He your grand object? Do you desire to do all things for His glory? Do you pray with Paul that you may bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ? Every word, every action. You see, is your life governed by God as the object, the goal, the subject, the all and in all? Are you living unto Him, living for Him, bowing beneath Him? Can you say, yes, by the grace of God, though I came into this world focused on myself, came into this world living like this, in the beginning, I, I wanted this and I wanted that. But now, by the grace of God, God has turned me around. And so my first thought, my first desire, my first yearning is God. In the beginning, God. You see, a true Christian fails at this many times. Oh, yes. But a true Christian is someone who desires to live consistently in this way, with God as his object and subject. And he desires to transcribe God's glory into the midst of this world. A true Christian says, I'm not here for myself. My comfort in life and death isn't that I belong to myself, but I live for the glory of God in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Genesis 1 teaches us several very major truths about God that show us His glory. And I want to look at those with you briefly a moment. The first truth is that God has priority over His creation and is yet independent of that creation. Let me say that again. God has priority over His creation and is simultaneously independent of His creation. That's what the opening words of the Bible teach us. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God has supremacy, doesn't He? God is obviously greater than the heavens and the earth. And God was there before He created this cosmos. In the beginning, God was already there. We saw that last week from, from 1 John. 1 John begins very similarly, doesn't it? That Jesus Christ was from the beginning, from eternity. And we saw last week the eternality of Jesus Christ. Well, here you see the eternality of the triune God. By the way, Elohim here, the word for God, is a plural form indicating with a singular verb that God has more than one person, even though He is one. So there is a trinity, and we will see that later in this chapter as well, that has one purpose and one goal that existed from eternity. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Jesus himself recognized that he was from eternity. The Bible says that he said, before Abraham was, I am. He also said, the glory I had with thee before the world began when he prayed to his father in John 17. And thou lovest me from before the foundation of the world. So Christ, and we know the Spirit, you see, from verse 2 was here as well. Because the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. 
The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit was self-sufficient from all eternity and had supremacy over anything that the Trinity itself would make. And so God is supreme. He is prior to and over His creation. That means God is the greatest and the biggest and the almost all-pervasive being that has ever lived. You see, it means we owe everything. We owe the existence of this world to God. We owe our lives to God. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. The heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Did you catch that last text? Psalm 102, verse 26. The heavens shall perish, but thou shalt endure. God is, you see, independent even of the heavens, even of his dwelling place. God is above it, beyond it. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. God is utterly self-sufficient. And that means, friend, God doesn't need this world. God doesn't need you and me. God doesn't need helpers. God doesn't even need defenders. And God doesn't even need worshipers. He seeketh worshipers to to worship Him in spirit and truth. But God is utterly and radically self-sufficient. And it is only our arrogance when we think that somehow God needs something in you and me. It is only a privilege to serve God. It is only a gift to worship God. It is only grace to be saved by God. God doesn't need us. In the beginning, God. You see, he's greater, he's transcendent than any one of us and all his creation. Thank you for listening to Doctrine for Life with Dr. Joel Beakey. If you were encouraged by this episode and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing and sharing with a friend. To enjoy more resources from the pen and pulpit of Dr. Beakey, please visit joelbeakey.org.